Hello, everyone, and welcome to phylloseminar.org. This is talk number four in a series of four talks introducing phylogenetics by master expositor Paul Lewis. Today, he's going to be talking about Bayesian phylogenetics. I've already introduced Paul in the first talk, so I'll just let him get started. If you want to ask a question, either tweet at phylloseminar or type your question in the live chat box to the right of the video on YouTube. Take it away, Paul. Thanks, Eric. So this is the last part in a four-part series, series, and uh, this particular part is 3B, and it builds pretty strongly on 3A. So if you hear something that doesn't quite make sense uh, and you haven't listened to 3, 3A, you might want to definitely go back and listen to part 3, 3A to get the background for this one. So this particular talk, I'm going to be talking about um, how you propose steps in um, a Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, so that's the first subsection. And then I'll talk a little bit about, sort of do a brief survey of common prior distributions that you might use uh, to place prior, to sort of capture your prior beliefs about the model before you um, consider the data. Then I'll spend a little bit of time on Bayes factors and how those are estimated. And also about trying to give you an intuitive feel for why they're useful in comparing models. And then, um, I'll finish up with a little medley of miscellaneous uh, concepts that um, terms that you will have heard probably if you have uh, been looking at the Bayesian phylogenetic literature but may not really understand what they mean. I, I'm not really going to uh, be able to spend enough time to make sure you understand those, but I'll try to give you sort of an intuitive feeling for what they're about. So let me get started with the first part. So let's talk about MCMC proposals. And so the last in the last part 3A of this series, I talked about uh, this metaphor of a, a robot walking around on a landscape given some simple rules. And with those simple rules, the robot tends to spend time in the highest part, more time in the highest parts and less time in the lowest parts and actually walks around in proportion to, um, so that you can count the steps in a particular area and that area then is proportional to the volume of the, of the of that curve uh, underneath that curve at that point so how does um, this part is going to be about how the robot chooses um, to take the next step and um, how it decides you know where to go in this space that uh, rep is represented by a phylogenetic analysis so bayesian phylogenetic and mcmc analysis in a nutshell you have to choose starting states you have to choose a starting tree starting branch lengths starting values for all of your model parameters and then you go through this cycle where you update one or more parameters in each part of the cycle. So an update um, involves choosing a parameter or parameters to update, proposing new states for those parameters. Uh, then you have to decide whether to accept those new states. So the, this is sort of the robot looks around in the proximity of where it's standing uh, to choose a new, uh, to propose a new, new place to go. Uh, it calculates the ratio of the height of that new spot to the height where it is now. And that ratio R um, is used to determine whether the robot actually goes there. If, if R is greater than one, then the robot would automatically take that step because it means it's going uphill. If R is less than one, then uh, the robot must draw um, a value from a uniform distribution. And if that value from the uniform distribution is less than R, then it would take the step. Otherwise, it rejects uh, that step. So um, the robot either stays put or moves to a proposed spot and you do this over and over again. Uh, and after each update, you save uh, the tree and the model parameters, or perhaps you skip a few steps and save tree and model parameters periodically. And then step four in this series means go back to two. So you just keep updating and keep saving until you have accumulated enough sample points. And then, um, then you sort of exit the cycle and you summarize the posterior samples that you have to try to learn something about the, what the data says about the problem. So one of the questions that we need to address is how does the robot move through a space that's complicated like tree space? So we, in the example that I gave you last time, the robot was just moving around in this simple two-dimensional space. So it's easy to do that. You just pick a spot you know, that's a some distance away from where you are and in a random compass direction. So that was very easy to, to to define a proposal distribution on that kind of space. But tree space is much more complicated. So I'll describe a simple 
uh, fairly old method for moving through tree space, one that was um, described by Largett and Simon in 1999, one of the earliest uh, MCMC proposals for Bayesian phylogenetics. So the way this works is that um, you have a tree. The first step is to pick three contiguous edges randomly. So you pick up this segment that consists of three edges that are connected, and you do that randomly. And that, in a fully bifurcating tree, that will define two, there will be two elbows in that, in that three-branch segment. And those two elbows define two different groups. Here I'm calling them X and Y. So the next step is to shrink or grow that three edge segment by a random amount. So it, here I've shown it being shrunk and you can see in the background, it grayed out the, the original length of the segment and now it's gotten shorter. So everything else about the tree is the same. We're just shortening those three branches by some proportional amount. So that's the, the second step in this proposal. And so now I've just erased the background so we could, we've decided on, a, on shrinking this three branch segment just a little bit and then the next step is to pick either X or Y randomly and whichever one you choose, um, move that somewhere randomly along that three edge uh, segment, the blue segment here. So I've chosen to move it. Um, you can see where I've chosen to move it, uh, but this choice is made randomly. So most of the time, or at least some of the time, it will end up not changing the tree topology because you're just moving it around in the, basically in the same segment it was in. But in this case, the, the random number that I chose to determine where it, where it lands ends up putting it on the other side of the other group X. So that would end up changing the tree by what is equivalent to a nearest neighbor interchange. So just we're just swapping two internal nodes basically. So that gives us this proposed new tree. So this is basically where the robot is, the spot the robot is eyeing, but it hasn't yet determined to go there. So then in order to, to determine whether it goes there, the robot would need, or the MCMC analysis would need to calculate the likelihood and the prior uh, distribution, the, the, the joint prior for this particular proposed tree and ask, you know, calculate that ratio R of the height of this proposed tree um, to the height of the tree that it was, that it's currently considering. Um, and so uh, if we do that, we find that the log posterior of the current tree is minus three, four, two, five, six in this particular example. And the proposed tree is minus three, two, five, one, nine. So because we're on a negative scale, this one on the right, even though it looks like a smaller in, in absolute magnitude, it's, it's actually a larger number, it's higher. And so because it's higher, the robot would automatically take that step. And so the current tree would become the proposed tree. And then we would you know, basically go through this process again, or maybe try changing a different parameter. So that's just gives you a flavor there are many different ways to move through tree space. This is only one of them. Um, and so this is just designed to give you sort of an idea of how a robot, an MCMC robot would take a step in tree space. If you do this many, many times, you end up with a sample of trees. Here I've shown a sample of six trees, uh, but you would typically have many thousands of trees that you've sampled. And if you're interested in particular a particular question, like whether A and C are together, then you could calculate just from the sample, you could calculate a simple fraction of trees that have A and C together. And this is an estimate of the marginal split posterior probability that A and C are together. So this is a, a split, we call this a split posterior. Sometimes they're called clade posteriors. Um, the split posterior is the, is the probability, the posterior probability that, that this particular split occurs that splits A and C, um, separates that from the rest of the taxa. And it's called marginal because Basically, the only thing that's perhaps in common between all of the trees that have this blue group circled in the, in the sample is that A and C are together. You know, they're probably different in base frequency composition. The, 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 the transition transversion ratio is probably different. Um, you know, the branch lengths are different. Even the, the rest of the tree is different, as you can see from in these three particular samples. So the, we're marginalizing over all the different possibilities and we're only looking at, basically we're graying out everything except for trees that have A and C together and counting up those and dividing by the total number of steps the robot's taken to get these marginal posterior probabilities. So that's um, how you might move through tree space. How do you uh, propose values for other model parameters? So most of our other model parameters are uh, continuous 
valued, and many of them um, cannot be negative. So for example, branch links cannot be negative. A proportion of invariable sites can't be negative. So, um, so here, uh, imagine theta is, an, is a parameter in the model, and it's on this real line. Um, I've included some part of that line being negative, just to, so we can illustrate what happens when we get too close to that zero mark. But the robot's going to, one, one possible way to choose uh, new values for some continuous valued parameter theta is to basically put up uh, a window around the current value of theta of a certain width. Here I've made it plus two and minus two in each direction. And then choose new values uniformly within that proposal win window. So if we were, if the robot was to look around, it would choose propose these kinds of values. They have to be within that proposal window. So um, it makes sense that, you know, if if you make the window wider, you're going to choose values, propose values on in, in reality that are uh, on average further away from where you are than if the window is narrower. So the you as the user of a program that does Bayesian phylogenetics have the ability to to make these proposals uh, bolder or less bold by changing these tuning parameters. And in this case, for this particular proposal, the tuning parameter is the width of this, this window that the robot's using to choose new values in. So if it looks like um, the, the robot's taking baby steps with respect to this particular parameter, you can make the window larger and it would take on average, go further with each proposed step. So, what happens if theta gets too close to zero? So in this case, theta is at one, and our proposal window uh, goes two in each direction, and so therefore it overlaps zero, and we have, you know, it's possible to pick values that are illegal for this parameter theta in this case. So we have some, this dotted proportion out, part of the window out here is, is uh, involves illegal values. In this case, we just reflect it back. So here's a particular value that we might propose that's okay. Here's a value that's okay. Here's a value that's outside of the, the valid range of theta. So we're just going to reflect it back by the same extent inside the valid range. Um, here's another case where we're, we proposed a value inside the window, but it was outside the valid range and we reflected it back. Um, and so interestingly, um, you don't actually, the Hastings ratio for this proposal is one. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain why that is, but uh, this is a symmetric proposal. So if you propose a value theta star, uh, given the current value theta, uh, the probability of making that proposal is the same as if you were to go the opposite direction or the probability density uh, going the other direction. Um, and so we don't actually have to worry about uh, calculating or adding a Hastings ratio to this proposal. It's, it's already symmetric. Once you um, update your continuous model parameters, um, you can, you get a sample of those values. And so here I've, created a histogram from a sample of 10,000 kappa values from an analysis that involves this kappa as a parameter. And I've used the program tracer for this and I've given you the, the um, uh, down below the latest uh, URL for tracer in case you wanna use this to summarize your own posterior distributions. So, you know, basically we need to summarize these 10,000 kappa values in some way so that we can make sense of them and a couple of common ways is just to calculate the mean. So the mean kappa is 2.6. So that's one summary statistic that you could calculate from a posterior, marginal posterior distribution of kappa values. The other thing you could do is calculate what's called a credible interval, which um, in this case, I've um, highlighted a 95% HPD credible interval where HPD stands for highest posterior density. So the way for a univariate parameter like this, if you're just looking at one uh, continuous parameter, you can just rank them from um, the highest posterior density to the lowest, and then take the, the top 95% of those and look and see what the, the minimum and maximum values are in that range. And that, in this case, it's 1.7 approximately to 3.5 approximately. So that means that the probability, given the data and the model, that kappa is within is between 1.7 and 3.5 is about 95%. So that gives you a kind of a sensible um, interval that tells you uh, basically where kappa is, is located in your particular problem. So th this is just gives you some ideas about how you can uh, make sense of the samples that you've taken from a posterior 
um, MCMC analysis. So let's talk a little bit about prior distributions now. So here's Bayes' rule again. Uh, I've highlighted the prior part of this. Um, the prior is what allows us to take the likelihood, which is the probability of the data given our unknowns that we want to learn about, and turn that into the probability of the unknowns given the data. So this is what we really would like to know. We'd like to know what's the probability of a particular clade, for example, given the data we've collected. Um, and what we can calculate easily is the likelihood, which is the probability of the data given that that clade is actually in the tree. Um, that's not really what we want to know. This is what we want to know, but in order to turn that around, to flip the conditional basically, so the D is on the right and, and the unknowns on the left, we need to multiply by the prior distribution. So we need to come up with uh, mathematical descriptions of our prior beliefs in whatever theta stands for here, this unknown component of our model. And uh, we do that using um, some standard probability distributions. And I'll just want to go through some very common um, cases um, of probability distributions that are used to represent prior beliefs in Bayesian analyses. So one of the most commonly used probability distributions is a gamma distribution. It has two parameters of its own, alpha and or alpha and beta, or A and B in this case. Um, and gamma distributions are appropriate for parameters that range from zero to infinity. Uh, for example, edge lengths or branch lengths. You can't have a negative branch length, um, but it, the branch length can potentially be um, very, very large. And in fact, it can go all the way to infinity, although that's not in practice what we see. Um, so gamma distributions uh, are good at providing prior beliefs. So I, I used the gamma distribution in the previous part to describe, um, you know, to characterize prior beliefs in my ability to shoot arrows at a target, for example. Um, and um, so you saw then that the gamma distribution can take on very many many different shapes, and it can 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 be applied to quite a you know range of prior beliefs. So you can go anywhere from having a prior belief that's pretty vague that says, you know, somewhere um, this this value is somewhere between zero and infinity. It tends to be closer to zero, but uh, the, the gamma density here drops off as a as the value of theta gets larger and larger. So you get this shape of the gamma distribution if the two parameters are the same value, or are, are both, are at least the first value is one. This first value is called the, the shape and the second value is the scale. If the shape is um, one, then you, a gamma distribution is the same as an exponential distribution. Um, and um, so they, an exponential di distribution is uh, a special case of the gamma distribution. And it looks like this, it goes up and hits the, the Y axis at the value one over the second parameter. Um, so um, you can make a gamma distribution that's fairly simple and just has a single, single parameter that tunes it if you uh, set the first shape parameter to one. If the first shape parameter is less than one, then you get a gamma distribution that has this kind of shape, which is fairly extreme and says that values tend to be very close to zero, and, but occasionally, uh, very rarely, you get very large values. Um, and then you can also make a gamma distribution if the shape is greater than one, you get a gamma, distribu gamma distribution that has a peak at it, a peak that's not zero, that has a mode that's greater than zero that looks kind of like a normal distribution, although it's not a normal distribution because a normal distribution would go off to infinity in both directions and the gamma distribution stops at zero. We say that the support of a probability distribution is that, that interval uh, where the, that probability distribution can potentially have a density greater than zero. And for the gamma distribution that support is goes from zero to infinity. Um, and um, so a normal distribution has support that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the two are different, even though they look, this looks similar to a normal distribution uh, in its shape for this particular combination of A and B. Be aware that um, gamma distributions can be defined uh, such that the, second, that the second parameter is the rate rather than the, the scale parameter. So I've, I've shown the gamma distribution parameterized by shape and scale. If it's parameterized by shape and rate, then um, you, the, variance, the, the mean and variance would be A over B and A over B squared rather than A times B and A times B squared. So I'm giving you the formulas for mean and variance so that you can figure out uh, if you know what mean and variance that you want for your, the gamma distribution, you can figure out what values of A and B to supply. <clears throat> 
Another distribution that has support zero to infinity is the log normal distribution. So the log normal distribution is a little bit strange because it has these parameters that are called mu and sigma, and those look very similar to the same parameters of a normal distribution. So in a normal distribution, mu would be the mean and sigma would be the standard deviation, but it's important to note that these are not the mean and standard deviation of the log normal distribution. The log norm, this particular log normal distribution has mu equals zero, but mu can't possibly be the mean, as you can see, because zero is at the very leftmost end and has zero density here. So the mean has to be out here somewhere. It can't be at zero. So mu cannot possibly represent the mean of this distribution. So why do why did statisticians sort of perversely um, call these parameters mu and sigma when they don't represent the mean and standard deviation? Well, the way the log normal distribution is defined, uh, if you have something that's log normally distributed and you take the log of it, then you get a normal distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. So if you take a, if you sampled values from this particular log normal distribution and you take the log of those values and made a histogram, it would look like this. It would look like a normal distribution centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. So the mean of a log normal distribution is not mu. Uh, in fact, what, what is that mean? Well, here's the formula for the mean of a log normal distribution. It involves both mu and sigma, uh, but it is more complicated. Um, so if you wanna calculate the mean of this distribution, you have to plug the mu and sigma into this formula and you find out that the mean is actually 1.65. It's about here. The variance is 4.67 for this particular combinations of mu and sigma. The mode is at 0.37. You can see that the peak of this here is about 0.37 and the median is one, which makes sense because the log of one is zero. And so that means that half of this distribution is, is going to have negative values and half is gonna be positive values. And it's gonna be a symmetrical normal distribution. If you would like to, if you know the mean and, and um, variance of the, that you want to, uh, apply to a log normal distribution, you can plug in M, the mean as M and V variance as V in this formula and get the mu and sigma that you need to specify the log normal distribution. It's uh, not a simple formula, but it, uh, this, this allows you to, to calculate those if you, want to, if you want to use a log normal distribution. Why would you use a log normal distribution over a gamma distribution? One advantage of a log normal distribution is that it always has a mode that's not at zero, whereas the gamma distribution can shoot off to infinity at zero, which leads to some kind of unexpected results. And so if you, if you definitely don't want your parameter value to ever get cl really close to zero, then you can supply a log normal distribution and it will keep it from going all the way to zero because the density of this is, of log normal distribution is zero at the value zero. So it, it, that sort of adds some stability sometimes to uh, MCMC analyses if the data are not providing a whole lot of information about the location of the parameter. So what do we do if we have a proportion, if our unknown uh, parameter is a proportion, like the proportion of invariable sites that we talked about in um, a couple of uh, uh, parts ago and we talked about models. So beta distributions are, are perfect for proportions because they um, have support from zero to one. So the beta distribution is defined between zero and one. And so it's sort of pinned down at these two extremes, but can have a variety of shapes in between. It kind of is like the gamma distribution and that can look fairly extreme like this red one. Uh, if A is, is less than B, um, the parameters of the, gamma of the beta distribution, it's symmetric if A is equal to B. So here's a case where it's symmetric. It's also symmetric if A is equal to B and both are equal to one. In that case, it's equal to the uniform distribution. So the uniform distribution is a special case of the beta distribution when the two parameters are equal to one. Um, and you can have a variety of other shapes. So here's a, a shape that uh, is, results from A being set to 1.2 and B being set to two. Um, the, the mean of this distribution is just A over A plus B. And so if you want it to sort of lean left, you make um, A less than the sum of A plus B. If you want it to sort of go more to the right, you can make A greater than the sum of A plus B. Or, um, yeah. So if A is greater than B, then it'll lean to the right. If A is less than B, then it'll lean to the left. Um, so um, so you, you can sort of decide what your prior beliefs are and sort of mold a beta distribution accordingly. And here are the formulas that might help you do that. 
So beta distribution is actually a special case of a Dirichlet distribution or a Dirichlet distribution. It's um, I hear it uh, pronounced both both ways. A Dirichlet distribution, a Dirichlet A B distribution would be the same as a beta A B distribution, but Dirichlet um, is usually used. That term is usually used when you have more than than one dimension. So in this case, we have three dimensions. Basically, we're using it. In this case, we have four parameters. A three-dimensional problem where the three dimensions have to do with nucleotide frequencies. So uh, nucleotide frequencies, as you know, um, the relative nucleotide frequencies that we use in models um, have to sum to one. So the fourth one, uh, no matter which one you choose to be the fourth one, the fourth one is determined by the other three. So there's only three degrees of freedom here. Uh, you can choose three of the four base frequencies, but the fourth one is is uh, can be obtained by subtraction, and is not you're not really free to choose the fourth one. So, a f if you have four parameters in a Dirichlet distribution, you really have three degrees of freedom, and um, it's hard for me to show this because we need four dimensions to show a three dimensional distribution uh, with the height. But I can show you what a sample uh, from this Dirichlet distribution looks like if I plot it in inside a tetrahedron like this, where the, the, the apices of the tetrahedron are the, are the four base frequencies. So if you set all of these equal to one, all of these parameters equal to one, you get a very flat, you get a completely flat Dirichlet distribution. And by flat, I mean that every possible combination of base frequencies is, is just as probable as any other combination. So basically this tetrahedron, the, the volume inside this tetrahedron is filled evenly with uh, these samples. It looks kind of thin on the edges, but that's because the tetrahedron is kind of thin uh, on the edges. The, the volume spreads out in the middle of this tetrahedron, and so you get a high, what looks like a higher density inside, but the density is the same of these points all through the, the tetrahedron. And then uh, if you, like the, like the beta distribution, if you make the two parameters of a beta distribution larger than one, then you get this symmetrical distribution that's, that's got a peak to it. Um, and so if you make all four of the Dirichlet parameters the same and all equal to 100, then you get, and you were to draw samples from that distribution, you would find that all of the, all of the samples involve frequencies that are nearly equal to each other. So all of these samples are clustered near the center of the tetrahedron, which means they're equally distant from each of the, the vertices and therefore just about equal to each other. Um, I've got to see if I can switch to my, I've got a little app here that um, I can use to play with this. And I'll, when I, I, I realize that I don't have the URL for this in the slides, but I'll put that in before Eric posts them later. But this just lets you play with this distribution. It lets you uh, twirl this around so you can see it better in three dimensions. Um, so if you make all of the, the four Dirichlet parameters the same, um, you can draw various samples and see that you know, they're pretty much evenly dispersed within this tetrahedron. We can draw a larger number of samples if we want to and spin it around and take a look at that. Um, we can also make it non-symmetric. So if you wanted to make, for, for example, a high AT bias, you could, you could set A and T to some larger value and you would get um, a sample that's sort of biased towards A's and T's. These points are closer to A and T than they are to C and, C and G. So if you wanna, you can modify a Dirichlet distribution to, so that you have sort of biased, if, if you believe that the, that there's an AT bias in the sequences that you're about to analyze, you could set up your prior so that it encourages an AT bias uh, to some extent. So that's, oops, I guess I did have that URL after all, so I don't need to put it in after all. That's, if you wanna play with a Dirichlet distribution, that might help you figure out what kind of Dirichlet distribution you want to use uh, for your base frequencies. Uh, Dirichlet distributions are useful for other things as well. For example, the GTR, um, relative rates, those exchangeabilities that we talked about in the GTR model, there are six of those. So you could have a Dirichlet A, B, C, D, E, F that would allow you to place a prior on those uh, GTR exchangeabilities. And we'll see another application of Dirichlet distribution in just a minute. So what kind of um, prior do you put on the tree topology? Well, one possibility, the simplest possibility is just to take all the possible tree topologies for five taxa, unrooted trees, there are 15 of those, and just say the probability for any one of these topologies is just one over the total number of topologies, so one 1 15th. 
So the prior probability of this particular tree topology is 1 15th and that one is 1 15th and so forth. That's called a discrete uniform distribution and that's the simplest uh, possible um, distribution you could use for tree topologies. Um, what do we do about edge links? Um, you could place a, you know, an exponential, a gamma or a log normal distribution on each edge, edge link separately. But what is commonly done these days is to use what's called a gamma Dirichlet compound distribution for, for edge links. And so the way this works is that you first think about choosing a tree length from a gamma distribution. So here's a gamma distribution with the, the shape and scale 2, 2. It means it has mean 4, which is right here. Um, it looks like this. So if I were to sample three values from this tree length distribution, which is this gamma 2, 2 distribution, I might get this value, this value, and this value. And this sort of shows you what those look like in terms of tree length. So the tree length is the, the sum of all the edge lengths in the tree. So if the tree length is very small, then you get basically a scaled down tree. If the tree length is large, then you get a fairly large tree. So that's one component. Um, and then let's just pretend like we sampled this guy here. Um, and then let's sample some proportions to go, edge length proportions to go with that. So we're gonna divide that total tree length up into different edge lengths by using a Dirichlet distribution to supply the proportions of the total tree length that apply to each of these seven edges. So there are seven edge lengths, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that means we need a Dirichlet with seven particular parameters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I make them all the same, that means that there's, basically we have no prior beliefs that any branch length are, or is longer than any other one. Um, so all branch length combinations are equally probable. And um, the only constraint is that the total sum of the branch lengths has to equal this tree length that we've uh, chosen. And so you can get crazy looking trees with this very flat Dirichlet prior because you can have really long and really short. You can have arbitrarily tiny branches and arbitrarily long branches with the constraint that they all have to sum to the tree length. Um, but we might wanna choose a more, uh, a more reasonable prior which says that the 10 parameters of the deer clay are all 10, and that way we get much more even uh, branch lengths. Or you could do something in between. If you did deer clay with seven twos here, you get something that's a little less crazy than this, but not quite as uniform as that if you wanted to set a prior. So if you, if you believe that your branch lengths are not this extreme, you might want to uh, bump up the deer clay parameter a little bit so that they're um, a little bit more uh, evenly spaced um, divisions of the tree length. So in reality, you know, I've described this as choosing a tree length and then choosing edge length proportions, but in reality, these two are combined together. And so the, if you, you're, you basically have a tree with branch lengths and you wanna know what's the probability, the prior probability of that tree length and those branch lengths. And so you would take the tree length and you would say, what, how, what's the density of this tree length uh, given my gamma prior on tree lengths. And that would tell you, the height here would tell you what the prior density of the tree length is. And then the proportions of that, you would ask the Dirichlet distribution to tell you what's the what's the density of that combination of proportions. And so um, when we're, if we're just sampling, we can choose a tree length and then choose proportions. But in reality, we're going to be given a tree that the robot's chosen and we have to calculate the prior. And so both of these um, are basically done together in that case. So, um, Paul, is, yes. is, I mean, is that sort of flexibility the reason why people prefer this gamma Dirichlet over a branch independent distribution? Um, the, the well, the, there was a controversy a few years ago about the if you put a prior on each particular branch length, even though that looks like a fairly vague prior, the fact that there are so many branch lengths in the tree means that it can induce a tree length distribution that's quite different than what you might expect the tree distribution. It can be the tree length distribution can be. Um, you know, quite the, the mean of the tree leaf distribution can be uh, surprisingly large and the variance surprisingly small um, for what appears to be reasonable branch length priors. And so um, based, based on a series of a, a particularly uh, important paper by uh, Renala and um, et al., they uh, showed that you could use the scamma Dirichlet distribution to sort of ameliorate that problem where you basically start by, you know, you basically define the tree length and then the branch lengths are defined based on that. So it, it solves the problem that people were having that the Bayesian analysis would, would, would end up choosing trees with very large tree lengths uh, because of the choice of prior that they had inadvertently placed on the branch lengths. Um, 
Does that help? <laughs> yeah, right on. I just, I just thought you might mention that. Thanks. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, so as, as time goes on, uh, we realize that some of the things we do in these analyses are problematic, and then uh, people come up with uh, ways to fix those particular problems and prevent them from being problematic. And that's, this is an example of, of one of those cases where we've come up with a better solution uh, for defining priors for, for, for branch links than we had before. Another possible approach to defining branch links is to combine the branch length prior with the tree topology prior. So uh, we can imagine, a, a if you imagine this process, and again, I'm going to describe this as a process of sampling a tree, but in reality, we would, we would have a tree and we would want to just calculate the probability of the tree given this prior, but it's easier to think about in, in sort of the, the, the way it's generated. So if we, if we have a, uh, start with a single lineage and it splits, um, then we can imagine each of these lineages carrying on for a time and having a certain rate at which they tend to split. So if that rate is lambda, then the, the rate at which this, you, uh, this tree would um, encounter the next speciation event would be twice lambda because there are two lineages, each of which can split at rate lambda. And so once that next split occurs, which could randomly be either left or right, I've chosen left here. Um, I've set, you know, in, in this particular case, it was the leftmost lineage that, that split first. We basically start a new era in this tree generation process in which now we have three lineages. And so the rate at which um, speciation occurs is now three lambda because there are three lineages, each of which is you know, has the potential to speciate at rate lambda. And so as you go on and more lineages accumulate, Basically, the time intervals between speciation events start getting smaller and smaller on average because uh, you have more and more lineages that can split, and it just takes one of them to split to, to end that particular epoch in the tree generation process. So uh, that's sort of a, a sort of a, a generative explanation of how this pure birth model works. You can make this more complicated by um, allowing uh, uh, extinction rate. So instead of a pure, pure birth model or a Yule model, you might have a birth death model that would um, make different predictions about how long these intervals are. But the key is that um, if you're calculating the prior for a particular tree, you can, uh, and it's a rooted tree, you can, um, you know, basically a time tree that in which all the edges are at, are lined up at the top. You can you can calculate a prior that takes account of the edge links. Basically, the edge links uh, are Come, you know, basically can be computed from these times of these epochs along the way. And you also have sort of built into this a, a prior for the tree topology because the tree to, the, the generative process that I uh, used to talk about this um, also generates a tree topology. So it's possible to, to use a, a model like this to specify a prior jointly on the tree topology and the edge links. And the time to the, to the next speciation event will be exponentially dis distributed uh, with rate proportional to the number of lineages as I've shown here. So uh, that's another possibility rather than choosing a tree length and edge length proportions, which we might do for unrooted trees. If we have rooted trees that, especially those that represent time and, and have all the tips lined up at the top, um, so-called ultrametric trees, then this might be uh, a better prior to use for those particular situations. So, um, that's the last of the discussion that I wanted to spend on on priors. Uh, it seems like a very small amount of uh, time on such an important topic, but we have to move on because I only have a certain amount of time uh, that Eric's going to give me today. So I want to spend a little time now talking about base factors and how they're used. Uh, base factors are you know, they're comp the components that go into them are marginal likelihoods, and so. Uh, in order to talk about base factors, we need to talk about marginal likelihoods. And uh, what I'm going to do is first talk about how to estimate a marginal likelihood. Then I'll talk a little bit about how those go into making a base factor. And then we'll talk a little bit about intuitively why um, calculating marginal likelihoods or estimating them is, um, is useful. Uh, why does that help us decide uh, which model is best in a Bayesian context? So let's go back to Bayes' rule. And I've augmented Bayes' rule a little bit by uh, making it explicit that that all of these quantities depend on the model that you're using. So if the model is M, then the posterior uh, basically is assuming this model. The, the likelihood assumes the model, the prior assumes the model, and 
the marginal posterior marginal probability of the data, the, the marginal so-called marginal likelihood in the bottom here is also dependent on the model. So if we change the model, we're going to change the value of this normalizing constant in the bottom. And um, we have been using MCMC because uh, MCMC only requires us to take ratios of posterior probabilities, a ratio of these two things. And this, uh, for a particular model, this probability of the data given the model will cancel and we don't actually have to calculate it. So that was, that was convenient. But it turns out that this quantity is useful when, we, when it comes to comparing models. And so now I'm going to talk about what if you wanted to, to estimate this quantity, how would you go about doing that? So it turns out that the probability of the, the data given the model this is what's called the marginal likelihood. Uh, it actually measures the average fit of the model M to the data. It's there, so it's very useful for choosing between models. So this is what the marginal likelihood looks like if you expand it out. It's the integral over all possible values of the unknown quantity. Um, and the, inside the integral, we have the prior times the likelihood. Um, sometimes this is called the posterior kernel. Um, it's the posterior probability density, um, but not normalized. So if we were to plot this out, it would look something like this. Um, and you know, if, if this were divided by the, the marginal likelihood, then this would be a probability distribution. It would be the posterior distribution and it would have area one. But right now we're not dividing by the marginal likelihood and so it doesn't have area one. And in fact, it's the area underneath this curve that we want to estimate. That's what this marginal likelihood represents. So, um, so what I've done is I've shown this uh, posterior kernel curve for a particular example that I'm gonna use throughout this, which is uh, basically a simple coin flipping example. We flipped a coin three times. We got one head out of the three flips and theta is the the tendency of the coin to come up heads. So it's the probability on any particular flip that the coin will come up heads. And it's, as you can see, it's kind of leaning to the left a little bit because we only saw one out of three flips. Um, if we had flipped it many more times and seen a more even distribution of heads, then it would be more symmetric, but it's a little bit lopsided to the left because of this, of the data we've collected. So how do we go about estimating the area under this curve? Well, a simple way to do it would be to just draw a box around this curve that's higher than the curve at every point, and then throw a bunch of darts at this box randomly and see how many of the darts are underneath the curve uh, compared to the box. The area of the box is easy to calculate because it's just the length times the width. Um, and then we could, if we know how many dots are inside underneath this curve compared to the total no number of dots we've thrown, we can use the area of the box and that proportion to figure out what the area of underneath this curve is. So it turns out that we do have a box like this. In this particular case, if I were to assume a flat prior from zero to one for our unknown value theta, which we can do, theta is a proportion, so it, it only goes between zero and one, so I can make my prior perfectly flat, um, then that basically defines a box, and we know that the, the prior distribution has area one because it is normalized. So we could, if we sample from our prior, um, then we could figure out what the area underneath this, this posterior kernel curve is. Um, and so if, if we did that, we would, here I've drawn, thrown basically 10,000 darts inside the box, 2,567 were under the curve. I know the area of the box is one. So that means that I've estimated a value of 0.2567 for the area under this curve. And the true value in this particular case is 0.25. So I've come quite close to, with 10,000 darts coming quite close to estimating the marginal likelihood in this particular case. The problem gets harder though, if you have a lot more data. So if we were to sample 40,000 flips and we saw 20,000 of them were heads, uh, then uh, look at the difference between the prior, which is up here at 1.0 and the posterior um, kernel. The posterior kernel now is really, really tiny because the, the this coincidence of of sampling 20,000 heads in the particular sequence we sampled them, sampled them is extremely um, is is extremely improbable, and therefore that's that's making this uh, area that we need to sample very tiny. So if you throw darts at this big box, very few of them are actually going to land underneath this um, this posterior kernel, and you're not going to get a very good estimate of the area of that. So that's a that's a problem. In fact, I threw 10,000 darts at the prior, um, and zero of them fell beneath this little tiny nubbin down here, which means that I would have estimated the area to be zero with this particular experiment, which is not a very good estimate of 
the marginal likelihood in this case. So how do we ameliorate this? And so uh, one possible way is to create these distributions that bridge between the posterior and the little tiny nubbin, which represents the posterior kernel, the prior and the posterior kernel. So what if we made a distribution that looked like this or a curve that looked like this, and we sampled um, from the prior, estimated the area of this curve and found that about 33% of the darts thrown at the larger box uh, were under this, this curve. Um, so now we know that the, the area under this curve is about 0.33. And then suppose we, we use that curve as our box and we sample a curve that's nested inside that. So now we do this and we find that 5.8% of the points that we throw at the bigger curve are inside the nested inner curve. And so now we can revise our previous estimate and we know that the, the area under this inner curve is now 1.0 times 0.33. That's the area of the outer one times 0.058. So now we've gotten it down to 0.019. We're still, our target is way down here, but we could just keep doing this, looking at smaller and smaller curves until we are, um, in, until we've basically um, gotten all the way down to the posterior kernel and estimated its uh, area relative to a slightly larger box. So we've broken up the estimation of the area under the posterior kernel into a series of five different area estimations. And the beauty of this is that um, parts of each of these ratios cancel out. And what we're left is A over G, where G is the area under the prior, um, that's the, the biggest box. And A is the area under the posterior kernel. That's the smallest one down here. And all of these intermediates just are sort of helpers. But uh, in the end result is that everything cancels except A over G, which is what we want. So we end up with the, the marginal likelihood, which is A over the area of the, post of the prior, which is, which is one. So the whole, this whole ratio is just the marginal likelihood that we wanted. And if we do this now, then uh, I've estimated the, the marginal likelihood to be 0.0000251. It's a very tiny number because it's a very tiny um, quantity down there. And the true value is 0 0.00025. So very close to what I estimated. So it helps to, to bridge this gap between the prior and the posterior kernel with these intermediate distributions. But how do you choose these intermediate distributions? How, how, what are the formulas that I use to get these, these intermediate distributions? Uh, it turns out that these, um, this is what's called a post power posterior kernel. Uh, the formulas that for all of these basically can be represented by this formula here. It's the prior, oops, prior times the likelihood, but the likelihood raise is raised to the power beta. If beta is equal to one, then we have just the prior times the likelihood, and that's the posterior kernel. That's this little tiny one down here. If beta is zero, and this whole term goes away because anything raised to the zero power is one, and one times any quantity is just that quantity. So we just end up with the prior. So when beta is zero, we have the prior. When beta is one, we have this posterior kernel. And so when beta is in between zero and one, we have we can make these intermediate distributions. And we can sample from those by just letting our robot explore this distribution with beta being a certain value in between, uh, rather than uh, you know exploring the prior or the posterior that explores one of these power posteriors. So we could set beta to 0.00032 and, and, have, and get samples from this distribution and then see how many of those samples are inside the next uh, nested level. Uh, so that allows us to, uh, I hope, hope I've convinced you that that allows us to get a pretty good estimate of the marginal likelihood, but what's a base factor? So a base factor is the marginal likelihood under one model over the marginal likelihood under a different model. So we have two different models, M0 and M1. Uh, base factor 0, 1 is just the ratio of those two. Normally, these marginal likelihoods are really tiny numbers, and we express them on the log scale. And so normally, when you see base factors in the literature, you're really seeing log of base factors. So the log of the base factor is just the difference between the log of the, the marginal likelihood of one model and the log of the marginal likelihood of the, of the other model. So how are how is this marginal likelihood useful in comparing models? So here I've got a case where um, the, I've simulated some data under the K2, K2P model or the K80 model. This model has two parameters, a branch length and a kappa value. We're, there's only two taxa. We're basically simulating just two sequences and the branch is the branch between those two sequences and those two taxa and the kappa is the, the, the ratio of uh, the rate ratio of transitions rate to transversion rate. I've uh, simulated a fairly small number of sites. Um, and um, 
and I've shown you the likelihood surface um, here. So the likelihood, this is not the posterior, it's not the even the posterior kernel, this is the likelihood surface. Uh, imagine that you have a prior that I haven't shown that's just flat over this rectangular area. Um, and um, the nice thing about this uh, two taxon example is that I can show the likelihood surface um, in three dimensions. And um, with more complicated models with actual trees, then it gets too many dimensions to, to illustrate. But uh, the nice thing is we can look at, at both of these models in the same space. So the Jukes Cantor model is just this line because the Jukes Cantor model is exactly the same as the K80 model, except the kappa is constrained to be one. So it's just this represents this line. So the marginal likelihood, um, one way to think about the marginal likelihood is it's the average uh, value of the likelihood over the space defined by the prior. So it's like a weighted average of the likelihood where the weights of the average come from the prior. And in this case, because I've assumed that the prior is flat over this whole uh, area, then it's just the this marginal likelihood is just the simple average of the likelihood. And it's easy to see that the, the average likelihood for the Jukes Cantor model is a lot smaller than the average likelihood for the K80 model, because the K80 model has the same height as the Jukes Cantor model in this area, but it gets way higher in certain areas. And that's because the K80 model has this extra dimension that allows it to get over here where the likelihood is, is high. Um, and so uh, in this case, if you were to estimate the marginal likelihood, the base factor, the base factor would favor the K80 model because the marginal, the average likelihood is higher for the K80 model than the Jukes Cantor model, which is everywhere pretty low. So hopefully that gives you sort of an intuitive feeling for why marginal likelihoods are useful. So uh, an interesting comparison to this would be, what if we simulated data under the Jukes Cantor model, basically set the true kappa to one rather than five. So if we do that, then we get a likelihood surface that looks like this. Um, in this case, both the K80 model and the Jukes Cantor model fit pretty well. Um, the, the K80 model actually fits a little bit better in some places than the Jukes Cantor model. Uh, and that's almost always the case when you have a model with more parameters, you get slightly better fit, at least in some at some points. Um, but the key here is that the Jukes Cantor model would have the higher average likelihood. And that's because the, the Jukes Cantor model can get almost as high as the K80 model. And it only has these, these little parts here that are really low. Whereas the K80 model has this gigantic area that's low. And if you've ever sort of bought, um, you know, tile, uh, for a floor, you know that, you know, 10 tiles in a line, um, you know, cost you a certain amount of money, but to tile a floor that's 10 by 10 uh, would cost you, you know, 10 times that. So um, whatever low values the Jukes Cantor model is experiencing here, the K80 model is experiencing 10 or 20 or 100 times more than that because it has this extra dimension um, that it's that of low area that it's adding in. So the average for the K80 model is lower than the average likelihood for the Jukes Cantor model. And so um, the so this using marginal likelihoods and base factors basically automatically penalizes the model for having extra parameters that don't help. So in this case, we have an extra parameter that represents a different dimension. Uh, this parameter doesn't really help us explain the data because the Jukes Cantor model does quite well here, but all it the effectively it adds the, all of this area of low fit, which goes into that average and brings the marginal likelihood down, making this model, the K80 model, uh, less desirable uh, than the Jukes Cantor model in this case. So I just wanna finish up by very briefly talking about a few terms that you might've heard about. Um, if you're, uh, these, these talks are designed for people that are just coming into the field or don't, um, you know, don't have a, a really solid knowledge of everything that's going on in Bayesian phylogenetics. And so you might've heard these terms, but may not know what they mean. And so I just wanna very briefly give you some ideas about what, what these terms mean, this, these jargon terms mean. So you might've heard people talk about hierarchical models. So what is, what is the difference between a hierarchical model and a non-hierarchical model? In a non-hierarchical model, um, all of the parameters in the model can be found in the likelihood function. So um, way back at the beginning of the series, I talked about how to calculate the likelihood uh, for a tree that looks like this with five branch length parameters under the Jukes Cantor mo model. And um, here's the formula that I used back in those earlier talks. And you can see the five branch lengths, which are the only parameters in the Jukes Cantor model, they're all present in this likelihood function. So there's just one level uh, non-hierarchical model, there's just one level to the model, and that's the like 
basically the likelihood level. And if we put priors on these parameters, we have to come up with some value like the prior mean, for example, and the variance that says uh, something about our prior beliefs of what, what these parameters are. And we may struggle to figure out what value to, to, to decide here. We might say, I have no idea what, what prior means should be for these guys. And so hierarchical models help you solve that by uh, replacing this actual number with another parameter. So what if we were to say, we don't know what the prior mean is, let's make it an unknown parameter of our model mu. And so if we, if we set the prior with mean mu, that means we have another parameter in our model, but this parameter is not inside the likelihood function. It's at a level above the likelihood function. So this is where the hierarchical part comes in. We have uh, other levels to our hierarchy besides just the likelihood level. And whenever we add another parameter, we have to add a prior for that parameter. And so we call this a hyperparameter to indicate that it's not in the likelihood function. And we call the prior for this hyperparameter a hyperprior. So this is sort of kick to come up with a mean variance for this prior, but you're at a level removed from the likelihood. And so you can, what, what you'll find is that you can put a very vague prior here, and this will come to hover around a value that makes sense for these branch length parameters. So it sort of saves you a little bit from a hard decision to make about this particular prior here by um, specifying a prior at a higher level, which, which uh, is le less influential than the prior at the, at the very basic level. So that's a hierarchical model. Empirical Bayes is maybe something you've heard about as well. And empirical Bayes is basically um, attempting to solve a similar problem. So we don't know what particular prior to put on these parameters in our likelihood function. We would like to, to sort of get some hints about what values to do there. So one possibility would be to, to basically get a maximum likelihood tree, get maximum likelihood estimates of these branch, branch lengths average them together, which I've done here. I've just taken those five branch length maximum likelihood estimates divided by five to get the average. And then we, we set our prior mean to that. So this is what's called empirical Bayes, where you where some component of the prior, uh, usually not all of the prior, we're not setting the variance this way, but we're, we're at least locating the mean of the prior by using the data that we're actually using for the MCMC Bayesian analysis. So pure Bayesians uh, would, would not like this because you're using the data twice. You're using the data to specify the prior, which is, and the prior is supposed to be something that's independent of the data, but here it's dependent on the data to some extent. Uh, but uh, that's what empirical Bayes is all about. And in practice, um, you know, this value here is what our hierarchical Bayesian mu would come to hover around. But the advantage of the hierarchical approach is that, you know, we're not actually setting this value. We're, we're you know, it might hover around this value, but it has some variation on either side, which this does, this empirical Bayes approach doesn't uh, incorporate. Uh, just got a couple more minutes. Let me just briefly talk about a couple more concepts. Reversible jump MCMC is something you might have heard a lot about. It's used quite often. Um, let me just give you some examples of reversible jump MCMC analyses to try to show you the flavor of, of why they're useful. Uh, so in this first case, you can see that we've taken some samples from our MCMC analysis and the trees here have different numbers of branch lengths. And so this tree has is fully bifurcating, whereas this one has a polytomy. So one this branch here is now missing. Um, then, um, you know, we, we delete this branch to get this tree, for example. So uh, in this case, some of the branch length parameters drop out and then come back in later. In this particular example, we we're going from what we're actually sampling are different models, substitution models, K80 model. Later on, we look in and we're visiting an HKY model. Then we're visiting a GTM model. Once again, we're adding and subtracting parameters as we go along. And so the K80 model, you know, to go from the K80 model to the HKY model, we've added uh, nucleotide frequency parameters and we've added the exchangeability parameters to get to the GTR model. And then we've later on, we've subtracted all of those to get back to the Jukes Cantor model. So the model is changing the the model is changing um, uh, its dimension along the way. We don't really have one model. We have a, a family of models and we're, we're jumping back and forth between the various members of this family of models. Um, here's the, the last example is just a species delimitation case where we have five species in this case, we peek in later and there's only four species because one of these nodes in the guide tree has been deleted. Um, three species, two species, back to three species and so the, the number of parameters in the model is changing as we go along. So this is another example of a reversible jump 
analyses. So reversible jump MCMC analyses are good when the model um, changes um, from one, you know, you're basically proposing a new model rather than proposing new values of parameters of a single model. Um, I'm just, I don't really have time to talk about this, so I think I'm going to skip this. Uh, basically, I was just uh, illustrating uh, one particular example of, uh, of, of, a, of one of these reversible jump models, but you can read this slide or you can go look at the original paper to see um, basically how this works. I just want to spend a, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the Deer Clay process prior. So the Deer Clay process prior is a very useful prior that's used um, in many Bayesian analyses. And it's useful when there's a certain number of um, quantities, a certain grouping of um, sites or um, uh, genes, for example, that you want to have, um, uh, and you're not exactly sure how many groups exist in the problem. So let's take a particular example. This has been used in hundreds of different applications, but I'm just going to take one particular one to talk about today, and that is uh, this uh, concordance analysis example uh, that's exemplified by the program Bucky. Um, which I've uh, given you a link to below. Um, suppose we have data for four genes and we would like to know uh, whether these four genes share a tree or whether they have different, different trees. So if they all share a tree, I'm gonna represent that by putting all four genes in the same box. And if they have separate trees, I'm gonna have all four trees in separate um, circles here. Um, and so we'd like a prior that uh, during the MCMC analysis, we'd like to go back and forth between these different scenarios. And so sometime we might be visiting a case where these two guys share a tree and those two guys share a tree, but these two trees are different. Sometimes we might be visiting a case where all the genes share a particular tree, and sometimes we might be visiting a case where they're all, they all have different trees. And we would like to sort of um, use our MCMC analysis to find out how many different trees there are uh, out there among our genes. Um, so um, you know, this kind of discordance can come about with lineage, incomplete lineage sorting and various things. So it'd be, be, be nice to know how many different tree topologies are required. Um, and so this deer clay process prior allows us to put a prior on this, these particular configurations of, of groupings. And the way this works is that um, if we start with one gene and we ask whether the second gene is in the same group as the first gene, we would um, basically have a weight of one. In th that case, if it's a separate, if we invent a separate category for it, then we, the weight is alpha. So alpha is gonna be our tuning parameter for this particular prior. So if we take this particular case, if we join um, with one of the existing groups, we give a weight of one. If we invent a new group, we give a weight of alpha. It gets more interesting if the groups already have a certain number of members. So if, if we have a group that already has a number of members in it and we say add another one to that group, the weight becomes larger because there are a certain number of group uh, members already in this group. So this weight basically is the number of elements that are already in the group and alpha is always the weight for adding a new group. And so in the end, if you if you start on the left and you just multiply these weights, you get these weights for the whole configuration. And what we can see here is that uh, as alpha gets bigger, uh, because you have lots more alphas down here, you're going to be emphasizing separateness. If alphas, um, you know, over here we have no alphas, and so this is if out, uh, you know, only one alpha in this case, and so if alphas, uh, this is going to be a smaller value. Let me just give you some examples. Um, before I run out, totally run out of time here. So if alpha is equal to 10, we're going to have, uh, because we have three alphas multiplied together here, we're gonna have a very big uh, bar for this particular configuration. So a priori, we're gonna be favoring larger um, uh, or, or smaller groups, uh, but more of them. Uh, and then, and we don't have, we're not gonna favor this group at all where everything shares the same tree. If alpha is smaller, say alpha is one, then we go the other way. We favor um, fewer, larger groups. And so in this case, the, the biggest bar is over this group that places in which all the genes share a particular tree. So remember this is a prior. So we're basically just using this to choose configurations without reference to the data. If there's information in the data that says that, that um, you know, that these, these um, all these genes have different trees, then this prior could be overruled and the probability of this particular configuration could be larger than the probability of that configuration. This is just the, the prior beliefs. Um, so I think I better stop there, uh, run out, of, run over just a little bit. I just wanted to say thanks to Eric Madsen for hosting these uh, final seminars and I've been uh, privileged to be a part of them.
Uh, I'd like to thank NSF for funding my research and also thank the many teachers who have helped me understand so that I can hopefully help you understand. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was really just such an excellent collection of talk. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like people are kind of shy for asking questions, but uh, I will just ask a, a quick question. Um, can can we talk uh, base factors a little bit? Um, is there, I mean, you know, you've explained it as this ratio of marginal likelihoods, but uh, how can we, can we understand that sort of more intuitively? Um, well, I tend to think in terms of marginal likelihoods instead of base factors and just the model that of the ones you're considering, the one that has the, the largest marginal likelihood is the one that should right. be considered the best. Uh, so base factors, the problem with base factors is they're only for comparing two models and they're basically just a function of the marginal likelihoods anyway. Uh, so and personally, I tend to just think in terms of marginal likelihoods. I'm not sure exactly what, what whether that answers your question or not. But. Yeah, I mean, I've heard people say, you know, it's the ratio of the probability of generating the data uh, under the two models is sort of a fair, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, um, I, I just love that um, the picture is showing like if the if the data is generated under you know K80 versus JC69, that was super cool. Yeah, I just wish that I could could do a more complicated example, but once you get past <laughs> three dimensions, it gets hard. It's hard to visualize. <laughs> yeah, and also stepping stone. I uh, anytime I you know I'm gonna send people straight to this video there, uh, which didn't seem so exciting. But that was very helpful. Yeah, I, and there, you know, as you know, there are many many ways to to estimate marginal likelihoods, and stepping stone is the one that I know the best because I was part of um, working on that. But I, um, you know, that that uh, to me, it's a very straightforward explanation of how to how you might go about estimating that uh, quantity. Um, and the other methods, uh, many of them are a lot harder to understand, so I tend to favor <laughs> using that that approach. Right. Well, I I did I mean I didn't think it was quite so easy to understand until I saw your series. <laughs> so anyway, um, that is it for this session, and um, we're going to take a break for the summer, and then when we come back, um, Andy McGee and my group is going to be um, hosting a series of talks, and uh, um, so we'll be sending out information about those in time. But thanks Great. again, Paul, and uh, see you folks in the fall. Thanks a lot.